All right, we actually have a lot of packages. Well, four of them. Well, I guess one technically arrived yesterday. I think that one. But let's just start opening these. Especially since we have right stuff packages. Yes, here we have to be a little careful because you know right stuff has string labels. That aside, because you know we have advertisements for those big box sets that I actually <coughs> have pre-ordered. And then one more. Let's see. take this out. This, which I actually I'm not so late and so I just kind of started opening it. Interesting. That's a bit of a big box, not a bad way. <clears throat> Obviously I don't want this to go in the pile itself as I need to compare. Okay. For some reason, I started processing the red box on the Amazon cover here as tape. Lots and lots of tape. But it's... Oof, it's not. It's just a little heavy. It's almost like an entire stack of anime. But, you know, obviously we need to cover that. So before we do, we put this on the top of that pile. Add these to this pile. Um, let's see. Okay. Let's do these in this order because, you know, obviously I got Ultra Sun and Ultraman. You can see this is unopened, but this is open. So that tells you <coughs> which version I'm playing. Obviously, we've got Skyrim for the Switch. I've mentioned before, you know, finally having a copy of that and being able to play it. Rime, I've been curious about. But let's actually take a peek in here. Because this is the Multiverse Edition, and I got the impression this is a generally well received game. I'm kind of curious because this is a little limited edition y. And, and maybe it's not that super limited edition y or something. I want to open it up and take a look. Oh. Right I guess I toss that. As come out stuff, come out stuff. Put that stuff up there. Stuff that stuff up there. Stuffing, stuff and stuff. What is this? Is this just spacing? This is just spacing. Okay, yeah, there we go. Deep in there, there's an actual Axiom Verge switch case. <clears throat> Which is good, because, you know, this is a kind of sprite key, and I was kind of worrying that it might be download only, but this, I was glad to get that it looked like it was physical copy, because I like my physical copies for some reason. Um, I guess I just really want to see that cartridge. Oh, it looks very Mario-esque. Interesting. And I think that's the exact point. Oh well. Where are some of these other things? Ooh, I got the soundtrack <coughs> making of documentary. Those are cool things. I have a poster, I think. Kind of reminds me of System Shock. Although technically I've never played it. Ooh, some art of... Interesting. But... You know, that's a distraction from anime DVD collection update. And so let's begin with the first anime DVD, which is obviously actually a Blu-ray. As you can see, I haven't opened this one yet. I just need to... I guess start the opening of the it -ing thing. Oh, yeah. This thing can be put aside. So we got Little Chicken Name of Volume 8. I guess I normally push stuff over here. 
keep this up here for now. We have a booklet with stuff, and then we have this. And as usual, you know, there's the disc, and they just have neat background. But I'm mostly curious about the cards. These have actually been the really neat thing about these. Now, I really ought to watch more of the show because, you know, the cards seem to be playing in, in that, uh, I can't think English at the moment. Oof. <clears throat> I don't know, eh, stuff. And then, then we have, oh look, it's a Future Diary, Blu-ray plus DVD. As I guess this has the LVA as well. Was this also the first Blu-ray release? I don't remember. Region A. English dub. There should of course be an English dub. If there wasn't, then that'd be weird because it was an English. There was an English dub before? Yeah. There was. Animation releases, right? For... I don't know. Let's just take a peek. We got discs. And let's see a region A thing there. So I guess these are the Blu rays. These are the DVDs. And here's the contents. <clears throat> okay. I've actually seen this name come up a couple times. So I'm a little curious about what this show even is. Not 100% sure looking at it. I'm loving it in the real world. Don't want to read too much because I like being surprised. Regions A and B. English dub. Oh, okay. Yeah, same stuff. Two discs. And then two discs. Of 129. That's interesting. Does this mean uh, I think Funimation might have done this? It's a lot of people. Crunchyroll, Funimation. But yeah, Funimation seems to be the main distributor. It's interesting how these seem to be the DVD versions first. Usually it's the Blu ray versions first. Huh. I'm actually just trying to look at the artwork through the camera. Just to see. I don't know. Looks curious. Very interested. We have Myriad Colors Phantom World, which I don't know anything about, but something about her is familiar. Like, I think I've seen pictures and it stands out because the colors are a little. There's something about the colors. Like, they feel a little. I'm tempted to use the word drab, but there's another part of me that says, do I even know what the fuck I'm trying to say by saying that? It's like, they're not super exciting or something. Okay, she looks actually really good there, or is that a different character? No, I guess... I don't know. It doesn't look bad. Why am I thinking purple? What the fuck is with that? Because that thing I don't understand is she looks kind of like, sort of like a genie. Okay, yeah, she looks very much like a genie. Cool. And now she looks like a. Okay, there's swimsuit people on the back. So let's um, begin by looking at this one. This one says anything. DVD there. So I guess it's DVD one, DVD two, OVA. Oh, that's nice. I don't know what to make of this. Why are there swimsuit versions of all these people? It's not that I have a problem with that, and also I was kind of wondering, ooh, region A, and I guess there's an English dub. This is a Funimation release. Well, of course, because this, this is, isn't how um, Sentai would release. This is where we one and two. Whoa. Don't fall out, Blu-ray. Yet another swimsuit girl. Swimsuits seem really prominent. 
That's not just a swimsuit. That's not even full athletic wear. That's like half bloomer. Okay. <clears throat> I have absolutely no idea what to think of this show. She has some sort of animal ears. So clearly, there's a swimsuit thing going on. But I don't, I'm not sure what else it's doing. These art cards are apparently in... Oh, look. It's lenticular. Oh, jeez. <laughs> That's stupid and fun. Okay. Oh. Okay, now, now this is actually giving me a bit more of a picture. So if she... Is that... I'm wondering if there's some sort of... Fantasy or video game theme going on here. Hmm. Okay, yeah, because, you know, she's cat girl. And then she's genie. Interesting. Okay, this was actually worth um, looking at these. These are some really neat um, cards. What this? Okay, this called them art cards and not postcards. And I think that's fair because, you know, as lenticulars, they're actually, um... Is that the right word? I can't remember if I'm using English correctly. Oh, well. Okay, that's an interesting curiosity. This one, I just really like the name. It makes me curious. So this is Sentai in your separate DVD Blu-ray releases. Let's take a look at this because we want to see if it's region A and B. Only A, but English dubbed. And then there's Sakamoto. I have to say, it oh god, I guess there's a lot of good, curious, curiosity-inducing stuff this week, because, you know, again, haven't you heard? I'm Sakamoto. There's something about that, just saying it that way, that just sounds amusing. Anyways, as a Sentai release, we kind of expect... Hmm. I was not expecting this card like this. Not that I was expecting anything, but... Uh -huh. Are those not the same general thing? What? What? Well, let's just see what Blue Raver has. Alright, I kind of expected this because this one is what? It looks like it's a kind of modified version of that with half the back part missing. I don't know. A curiosity. Except we got Tales of, Vest Tales of Zestria the X. Oh, look, this is another region A plus B. We're, we're getting a lot of those this week. And now we can't read a damn thing because of the dark brown text on black background and reflecting camera stuff. Let's get this off. So we can... Ooh. That's an injury on the back. And we've got more art cards, which may not be lenticular, but I'm trying to... I can't even damn, read this damn thing. Okay, I'm going to have to do this. It looks like there's English dub. I think we expect English dub. You know, it looks Funimation-y, release -y. See, I haven't played much Tales of, and a little bit of Tales of anime stuff has obviously not been... Is this based on a game, or is this an anime-specific thing? Oh, jeez. Do you know what? I think we have to take the individual discs out because there are characters behind them and we want to take a look at the artwork. I actually kind of like this artwork. That's Blu-ray 1. Or, yeah, Season 1, Blu-ray 1, 0 through 6. More people. This, I'm actually, you know, a bit curious about this. Oh, she says she has a giant claw arm. I actually kind of like claw arms. Those are fun. So are sword whips. That's her without... Okay, so she's got a bandage. So I guess it's a deployable weapon, which is always a good thing. Oh, 
Okay, now I'm very curious about this. Well, maybe I have more time. I've got, I'm taking um, tomorrow and Friday off. Of course, I'm going to be baking pumpkin pie tomorrow, and I have to decide if I'm going to finish watching the anime I'm currently watching. I'm not expecting much from it. And there's no lenticular here, but that's okay. You know, just more artwork, and I, I kind of like these character designs. It's possible the show's shit, but, yeah, I don't know. You know, sometimes, you know, people are really just trying a bunch of different things. So there's usually always something that's good about a show, even if it's, for the most part, not going to be liked by most people. But I think they're trying. We're trying to find things we want to watch. And this is the third, um... Oh, look, you know... You, uh, there we go. Kizumonogatari Part 3. The Invisible One. And now that this is out, I can actually follow the advice that one of my subscribers gave, which is to watch all three. Although I don't know exactly how I'm going to do that, because I've been re-watching a lot of the old stuff. Okay, that just came right off. I've been re-watching stuff with a friend, and we just finished Owari Monogatari, which means that he's at the same point I'm at, which is time to watch Kizu Monogatari. Well, there's a familiar image. I think that was on Ride Stuff as the artwork for this thing, which makes sense because if it was the actual case itself, nobody would be able to fucking read it. And these are the kind of postcards I generally don't open up because it's a pain getting them back into the plastic, and I don't know why I even need to do that, but I do. And whatever. <coughs> We've got Blu-ray and we've got soundtrack. All right, and all together that's three and a half hours of stuff, I think. Um, assuming the um, the mal time length is accurate. This one is a highly notable one, one in this corner of the world. So um, notable that there's even a, a Rotten Tomatoes thing on it and a. You know, there's a lot of stickers on it. See, I see a region A there, so this is only region A. Blu-ray DVD, okay, cool, because this is a Blu-ray DVD combo pack. <clears throat> I have a vague idea of... I guess not exactly what this is, but more of a setting. Don't know if I want to say it because I don't know if it's spoiler or not. I doubt it is, but... Whatever. Uh, let's see. First of all, I'm gonna... Whatever. No available in print and digital. So it looks like a little manga sample. And then here we have DVD and Blu-ray versions, you know, which have the same disc art and City. The bustling city life. This one is another curiosity. I don't know when I'll watch all this. Because it almost sounds like I want to watch absolutely everything that came out this week. Probably don't need to watch this. This is Kite Uncut on Blu-ray. Uh, as you can see, it's under the Kitty Media label. So let me take a peek. Because <clears throat> if it's under, if it's released under Kitty Media, then, well... It says uncut. And if this isn't the director's cut, then I think this is the one that's supposed to be closest to the original cut, which means some of the more provocative scenes, I guess, are still in there. Because, okay, yeah. I, I was just double checking off the side. Is this one? Because it, is, it should be Blu-ray. It says Region A. Looked pressed. But yeah, so like there's, I think, there's multiple different edits, but I think there's three that are generally released on home video. There was a previous Blu-ray release for the most edited version of this, but this looks like it's a Blu-ray release of the most unedited version. And basically, um, I don't know if this is spoiler or not, but the basic idea is... 
I don't know how to put it. Whatever. I'm, I'm trying to think too hard, and I just don't have the mental energy. So, here's this week's anime DVD collection update. A little late, but here. So, I finished uh, The Testament of Sister New Devil. I, I have to read it because the ordering of words is always a little weird, I guess. Um, overall, it was okay. Um, like I said before, the entire curse idea they introduce, it feels like it interferes a bit, and I think, you know, having watched it all and stuff, I think what it mostly comes down to is it's an interesting balance. It actually creates um, fan service opportunities that I don't normally see in these. In fact, this one got uh, closer to pornographic related stuff than a lot of things I've seen, but there isn't any actual, um, you know, sexual relations between the characters, but it feels pretty close, and I think that's supposed to be some of the idea. And mm, I think that maybe kind of hits on an interesting preference thing where it means there's a lot more fan service in it. So there's a lot compared to other um, shows kind of like it, the Battle Harem animes, I guess. Not, not anything... I guess it's more like there are certain boundaries they are able to cross more because of what they set up. But for me, I guess the reason I don't really care is because it kind of loses all presumptions of in or all presentation of intimacy, I suppose. Which, you know, that could be a, a real preference thing. And I know I'm Englishing really bad right now. But the, ki the kind of thing I'm talking about is it feels like they've constructed this artificial thing and it doesn't really feel like the characters are getting close because they're getting close but so much as they've been kind of contrived into a situation. I suppose a really good example of something that doesn't even have to do with the curse and maybe just the attitude of the anime in general is um, Succubus Girl and it's sort of like there's moments there where it's like well this would almost feel intimate except it doesn't feel like that she's doing it because she likes him so much as because she's a succubus who is enthralled by the ideas of um, sex in general. And, you know, I, I'm sure there's enjoyable elements of it. I mean, I have to admit that, you know, the artwork on this is actually, you know, neat. But content-wise, you know, I can't help but think of things like, um, like, I envisioned if I ever showed, edited this to show scenes, you know, Monogatari might have some really good examples because there's little simple things where it's like, there's a scene where she's sitting in his lap and for me it feels like she's more trying to manipulate him and there isn't a real intimacy connection between them. And maybe that's not fair because the scene I was thinking of is, who knows, a couple dozen episodes into Monogatari where, you know, one character is sitting on another's lap, but that one is just like, even though they're not drawing attention to it, like this show is trying to draw attention to that, um, it shows a kind of level of intimacy that suggests things about the mindsets of the characters and their relationship to each other without explicitly stating it, even though, you know, they not so subtly also express some of those things earlier in that same story arc. So, um, and story-wise, you know, stuff happens. Overall, you know, it follows some tropes. It subverts some... It's overall not a bad show. And I can see for some people, they probably really, really like this. I can't really blame them for that. It just didn't cater to my specific tastes. Um, Honda Kun, this was actually pretty fun. I actually went through the episodes with some good speed. Now, it also helped that I wasn't doing anything that was preventing me from watching anime. I mean, I've done a lot of cooking and was thinking and focusing on a lot of that. And obviously, it's not Thanksgiving yet, so I still have some more actual real cooking that I'm going to do, which is not too different than the one I've been doing, but, you know, in full gear. So, like, pumpkin pie tomorrow. And then peeling a lot of potatoes the day after. And I have to decide when I'm putting the turkeys in the slow cooker. And whatever. Anyways, back to this. So, um... This one says, everyone loves him but him, but I don't think this is a good way of really describing because the general premise of this show is everybody thinks he's the most popular character or the most popular person in school except for him. He thinks he's the least popular person in school. 
And a lot of what makes this show enjoyable is this element that usually I don't like so much, where you have somebody who says something and then you have somebody else who takes it to some weird, not very logical conclusion that's completely opposite of it. So this show is kind of based on a lot of stuff like that, except it's not deliberately setting up people to suffer per se so much as it's setting up to maintain a status quo. And it's it's actually really good at doing it. It's funny because, you know, you'll have him who will take a situation and interpret it completely the opposite of what it would actually mean. But the other people on the other side of it are doing the exact same thing and we're seeing it backwards from what it is. So everybody keeps thinking of him as some sort of god tier character and he keeps seeing himself as the um, most, the least popular person in school and it works out really well. And surprisingly, it had enough material to keep itself going for a season. And I think it also kind of ended the season in a way where it's like, you know, it kind of knew the idea it wanted to play with and knew not to go so far with it that it made the joke stale. It actually just kept it kind of fresh and fun the whole way. My favorite character is definitely Eraser. But, you know, that's that. And then I moved on to First Love Monster. You know, I kind of was very curious about this. You know, this kind of seems intimate, this relationship here. And I was kind of curious about that sort of thing. That was probably my main draw. And watching it, and then I think yesterday I also looked at the My Anime List rating. I'm like, oh, wow, this thing's rated very low. And I guess I could kind of see why. Um, for starters, it's probably not as bad as the rating would have it be, but it might depend on your um, preferences for certain topics. So let's begin with the main point. This is something that they kind of play around with in the first episode, but I think I want to say it because I think it's an important thing to keep in mind if you're going to try to watch this. The main gimmick it's going for is that, you know, She's there, transferred to town to go to high school on her own. She's been pampered, whatever. The guy, who's clearly the um, person she's potentially intimate with, is actually a fifth grader. And he, he isn't somebody that got held back. He and a couple of his friends just had a ridiculously early growth spurt. So, by all appearances and some actions, he appears to be this older shonen guy that you would expect a high school girl to fall in love and they're playing around with it the other way and I think this is worth mentioning even though it may change your impression of the first episode because you don't know it in advance simply because I suspect part of the low rating is people just disgusted by the concept and you know what that's whatever. Um, for me, it's one of those things where I want to see where it goes with it, what it does with it, because I'm not in and of itself insulted by it because our society just has this weird idea that post-pubescent people shouldn't be thought of sexually, and at the same time, we can't ignore the fact that they're going to be sexual with each other, even if we are defining all these weird artificial boundaries. So, you know, that's why we have Romeo and Juliet laws, so that people who are of a similar age are experimenting and you don't just throw them in jail for ruining their lives for having sex and the way that their lives are being ruined is by the justice system. You know, it, there's a weird circular logic there that just doesn't make any justice sense. So, taking aside all that stuff and our society having this weird view, the fact that they're that tall is suggests that they had a really early growth spurt and t they're probably post-pubescent. Maybe? And so, it's interesting to see if it, how it deals with that because sometimes it can be the sort of thing where it's like, okay, yeah, she's interested, but then she kind of knows the boundaries there and that's the way it plays it. And as long as they're not saying, oh yes, you should definitely just go out and have sex with anybody under the age of consent, then maybe it's at just asking valid questions or setting up interesting narratives where there's an interest, there's an intentional barrier. But part of the problem, ignoring the fact that, as I just said, they've clearly gone through puberty even though they're fifth graders, I think part of the problem is they don't really act like fifth graders. And I think that, that did, takes away from it a whole lot because 
it seems to me that the show's a little distracted by its gimmick to the point of they're talking about poo-poo and wieners and it's like it feels more like five-year-olds than fifth graders like they accidentally divided their ages in half I mean when I was in fifth grade and technically I wasn't actually in fifth grade but when I was that age right this is one of those weird things where you can make fun of me and I was a homeschooler right but when I was that age I was actually self teaching myself how to program in basic now there's plenty of stupid things I did uh, plenty of stupid things kids that age do but this is beyond that this is like it's focused on the idea that they're elementary schoolers, but ignoring the fact that technically they're on the edge of it, about to go into middle school, and they're a little grown up for their ages. They don't necessarily have to be mentally grown up, but they're going to be treated differently because of that. And so they're not going to act the way they act. They're not going to... It just... There's a disconnect there. So I think the show got a little carried away with its premise. And at the same time, it doesn't seem to really have any idea of what it's going to do with this gimmick other than it be a barrier, but then it keeps forgetting that she's the main character half the time. Maybe not half the time, that's maybe not um, too unfair. So, that's a lot of criticism, and really that's more about, you know, I understand why um, this probably doesn't appeal to a lot of people, even to people you would think it would appeal to, outside the fact that knowing that it is about... Um, a high school girl having to deal with the problems of having fallen in love with somebody who's below the age of consent. But overall, I found it's okay to have on in the background. Sometimes I just don't care as much because, again, they I think they got the personality of a fifth grader wrong. Like, they're too young. They should be trying to play more complicated games as opposed to stuff. I don't know. And the relationship doesn't even seem to really be addressing the fact that the relationship is the issue and, you know, it's distracted. I guess that's one thing I kept, I keep forgetting that I'm saying is sometimes he does things that are supposed to be, oh, is he leaning in for a kiss or something, but he's actually reaching for something else. And the problem is it's very contrived. So, you know, it's not the best of the things out there. And I'm curious if the ending will be notable. But I guess, uh, you know, I'll just continue watching it to find out. It just seems to be kind of a little moving on autopilot. But surprisingly, I'm not finding the characters particularly distasteful. I'm just kind of curious where the series is trying to go with the concept. And, you know, it's not doing much. But like I said, you know, I kind of realize I don't expect it to really go anywhere because it hasn't been going anywhere, which is why I wonder if maybe I'm going to watch something else that's come out this week because there's been a lot of stuff. Um, I guess video game update related stuff because I think you all heard that I finished Skyrim and played the first level of Doom 2016, so... You know, I started a little bit of Skyrim, and it's okay. Uh, I mean, I, I need to put more time into it, but, you know, that's not the priority right now. The priority is uh, Pokemon, because Ultra Sun, Ultra Moon came out, and because I've been spending a lot of time doing food preparation, experimentation and stuff, I guess I had enough time to really decide how I wanted to play through it, and I decided to play through it the um, half-lazy way, I guess. That's the one where I sent some eggs over into Ultra Sun from my Pokemon Moon, which is obviously a very well-developed game and already has a lot of resources. And I hatch them and send everything, all four of the Pokemon back, you know, the starter and the three eggs I send, and I Eevee train them because Eevee training is so quick and easy in the uh, 7th gen now, and I level them up to 63 and 64, I think was where they all reached teaching them specific TMs and having everything set up like that. And I'm not playing it like my normal blitz through a game strategy per se. I'm not talking to everybody and exploring absolutely every niche and nook and cranny and something. But I am still just not focusing on the combat and the team building a whole lot. So I'm just trying to experience what they changed about the game compared to Sun and Moon. And so far, I'm surprised by 
So, initially starting it, it didn't feel like there was that much different, but then, you know, it, it felt like there's been good differences here and there. I, I don't want to go into too much detail, because, you know, you, if you haven't started playing it, you should play it, or not should play it, but you're probably going to play it and don't want all this stuff spoiled, but overall, I'm curious. I want to keep going, but it might not be until after Thanksgiving that I really hit it hard, I guess. Second Island, not that far. Again, been moving kind of slow, but I think that's stuff. Yeah, that's probably all the stuff. Uh, Y'all, have a nice week.